Demons. Hell hell hounds chase ghosts come sleep. sleep. Watch out. Demons are coming. Run. Sleep. Hide spirits. Run. Ghosts. Ghosts. Hide. Hell hounds. Demons. Hell hounds. Ghosts. Demons are coming. Welcome home, my little hellhounds. Tonight we have three scary stories to sink our hellish teeth into. If you have any scary stories you want narrated on the channel, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares and follow me on twitter at home of scares. Also, if you like this content, then don't forget to subscribe and click that like button. And don't forget to tickle the bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. Now, let's get right into it. Premonition Nightmare Posted by Yum130794 When I was young, I used to have the talent of having premonition dreams. Obviously, at the time, I wouldn't know what they meant. But years later, I've found explanations for them, more or less. In this story, I will explain one such dream that I had, and yes, I remember it to a T. When I was 10, I used to go to an elementary school, very close to my apartment. The school was surrounded by 10th floor apartment buildings, communist blocks for those who need a mental image of it and in the middle of them, there was my school. One night, I had a very detailed and long nightmare, from which I physically couldn't wake up. The nightmare started with your typical horror movie American wooden house in the forest. You had the entrance stairs, the porch leading to the front door, windows on both the left and the right side of the door. I enter this house knowing in my heart that this is my own house where I live with mother and father and only the three of us. I open this door where I am faced with a long hallway and a set of stairs on the right parallel with the hallways. Stairs leading to the upper level of the house. Also from the main entrance there are two more doors one to my left leading to the dining room and the kitchen and to my right leading to the living room. This dream house is designed as your generic 50s household. Everything is old. Wood is squeaking. The house is always rearranging itself from time to time. The only thing off about this very old house is its living room. My father appears in my dream. He looks exactly like my real father, tall, blonde, with blue eyes. He is very young, but he is my father, and I feel it in my heart. He loves me during my dream, but he is concerned. He calls me into the living room. I follow his voice and enter this room. It's completely different than the rest of the house. Everything is very high tech. There isn't much furniture in this room, but there is an enormous plasma TV covering an entire wall, which is now turned off. There is a computer in the room and also a glass bar. On the opposite wall, there are about 15 clocks, all set at the same time. 15, 15. The ticking is loud and annoying. 
My dream father asks me to sit down on the couch next to him. I do as he asks me. His voice is shaking. His eyes are worried. Holding his hands together, he tells me, Darling, the hospital called me because there is an emergency I need to attend. That means you will have to take care of your mother for tonight. You know she doesn't feel well sometimes and you know what we have to go through when that happens. In my dream I am not shocked, as with his words I am reminded that my dream mother is epileptic and sometimes has seizures and my father tends to her and brings her back to normal. Dream father continues, you are old enough to learn how to take care of your mother or at least how to call for help. He then proceeds to walk towards the plasma TV and turn it on. The screen now displays two huge buttons, one red which says no and one green which says yes. This screen is connected to the emergency line to the hospital. If your mother has a seizure and hasn't gotten her medication in time, all you have to do is press the yes button and an ambulance will arrive here in due time to save her life. All you need to know is to press the button which says yes. I nod to my dream dad and assure him that I will take care of mother as long as needed. Smiling, he hugs me and leaves for work. I am not left alone in this eerie house. Looking at the TV and back at the clock on the walls. Strangely enough, not a minute had passed during all this conversation with my dream dad. The time still being 15.15. Sweetheart, you there? I hear my mother calling for me from the kitchen. I leave the living room where I meet my dream mother next to the entrance door. My dream mother looks nothing like my real mother. She is tall, slim, long blonde and glowing hair with icy cold blue eyes. She is extremely beautiful and has a soothing voice but I do not feel motherly love coming out from her. She smiles at me and asks me what I would like for dinner and by the time I get the chance to answer her she falls down onto my lap having a full blown seizure right in front of my tearing eyes. I freeze in panic, completely forgetting everything my dream father had told me just minutes earlier. Luckily I remember what to do. I pull her twitching body mouth covered in drool, foam and eyes rolled back into her head. I feel panic, fear and sadness. Desperately I go to the plasma TV knowing I have to select the yes button no matter what. But something is off. The colours are now switched. The green button now says no whilst the red button now says yes. I don't know what to do. I look at mother, she is slowly choking in her own saliva. So I decide to press the red yes button and rush back to her and put her head on my lap. The room is covered in silence. She doesn't move anymore. Mother, are you alright? Do you hear me? Please, mother, answer me. I am scared. Suddenly, all the clocks on the wall begin to ring fiercely, the time being still 15.15. I am afraid. Turn my eyes back to my laying mother, which out of nowhere turned her head to the side with a loud neck crack, head rolling down my lap on the groan and into the corner of the room. I am shocked. The room turns bloody red, the clocks are ringing chaotically, and the headless body on my lap slowly turns into ashes in front of my very eyes. I look back at the head 
which just detached on its own and rolled away. I get up and walk towards it, refusing to acknowledge that this just happened. Mom, is is that you? I hear a soft slither coming out from under the living room table located in the far corner of the room. From underneath of it, my mother's head slithers out, completed by a snake body with a deformed shape, jaw is barely hanging, eyes are missing completely, a snake tongue is hissing back at me, fast enough, starts to chase after me, I panic and scream out loud and burst out of the living room, with tears in my eyes, knowing in my heart that creature cannot be my mother, I attempt to leave the house but the main door is locked, I rush on in the long hallway trying to escape through the back door but I run and run and run and the hallways feel as if it's stretching for miles to come. As I run I look behind me. The snake like zombie head is chasing me frantically, blood pouring from the eye sockets, hair falling off of it and hissing loudly. I scream, praying to reach the door at the end of the hall, and I do, but it's locked. I turn around, the creature is almost at my neck, it lunges at me, I close my eyes and gasp. I gasp for a big breath, and I touch my neck, I am now awake in my apartment, in my bedroom, the time is... 3.15 in the morning. I have school in five hours. I feel tears coming from my eyes as I am filled with feelings of dread and sadness of which I haven't ever felt so strong. I go to my parents' bedroom only to see them sleeping together. I go to my mother's bedside and hear her breathe. I sigh with relief. She is fine. I decide to go back to sleep and do not continue the nightmare. Morning comes and I go to school. On my way to school, the road is blocked by an ambulance. The paramedics are carrying a body bag. From the body bag there is a strain of gold-like hair hanging out. My stomach hurts. My heart is stinging. I get closer and ask around what happened. A shocked neighbour explains to me, Lorraine. Lorraine was murdered last night by her husband. He cut her head off and ran away, letting her rot in the house. Poor Lorraine. Wasn't it enough? She had such a hard time dealing with epilepsy. Tears trickled down my cheeks as I ask a paramedic if they'd had a time of death. Seeing me full-blown crying, she answered, Time of death at around 3am and 3.15am. I look at the ambulance as they pack Lorraine and take her away, thinking to myself that I have dream in a much metaphorical way, her own death, and could do nothing about it. It's been 17 years since I had this dream, and I still have tears in my eyes as I write this story, and remember of Lorraine, a neighbour I never personally knew, but whose painful death still sticks to my mind under the shape of a childhood dream. Lorraine, if you can hear this story from heaven, I hope you found your peace in the end.
Whatever you do, never trust the girl who plays hockey with boys. Posted by A Gigante 02. A few rays of sunshine snuck through my curtains as my 6.30am alarm went off. I groggily reached over and turned it off. I had a hockey game this morning and if I'm honest, I would have rather stayed in bed. The only thing that got me to my feet was the fact that I would see Anna today. Anna was the only girl on our team and the entire league. She was well respected by many coaches and players throughout the large rink we played at. She was only a sophomore but had already been offered multiple scholarships for huge hockey schools in Gwinnipeg University and Boston University. She was probably the most beautiful girl I've ever laid eyes on. Her long golden hair would flow out the back of her helmet and her icy blue eyes warmed my heart whenever our eyes locked. Don't even get me started on her body. She had the most perfect hourglass figure. Anna was like an angel sent straight from heaven. After getting off to dirty thoughts of her, I got out of bed and made my way towards the bathroom. Even though by the end of the game I would be a, a sweaty mess, I still wanted to look good for Anna. As bad as this sounds, my team and I jokingly wonder who will be the first to get with Anna. Sure, she was a human just like the rest of us, but we were a bunch of horny 15 and 16 year olds who have never been with a girl. Trevor, hurry up, you're going to be late. My dad's voice echoed through the house. I threw on a hat and scurried down the stairs, almost tripping over my own feet. I checked my bag twice to make sure I had all my equipment and then loaded my bag into the bed of my dad's truck. I ripped my jerseys off the hangers they hung from in the garage and neatly laid them out on the back seat. Two minutes later, my dad walked out with my water bottle in hand and jumped into the truck. My dad pulled the truck around to the front of the Twin Oaks ice rink to drop me off. I'm sorry I can't stay bud, they called me into work, my dad said as I was about to hop out. It's okay, I replied, knowing that this would happen as my father rarely attended any of my games. It was times like these where I wish my mother was still alive. I lifted my heavy bag onto my shoulder, grabbed my sticks and jerseys and walked into the rink. The TV in the lobby had the game schedules and which rink and locker room each team would be in. My eyes scanned the screens waiting for the Hawks to come up on the screen. Rotherhithe Hawks, South Rink, Locker Room 3, the screen eventually read. I trudged through the lobby and as I opened the door to the rink, a wave of cold air hit my face, followed by sounds of cheering. There was a game going on and was about to end soon so my team could play. I set my sticks aside the locker room and opened the door. I was far from prepared for this moment. Sat in the far back of the locker room was Anna. Just Anna. Nobody else was here yet. Hey, what's up? She said while taping up her socks. Nothing really. You ready for today's game? I asked as I made my way to sit beside her. If I'm being honest, no, not really, she said. Why not? The Sea Wolves aren't that good and their captain is out with a broken wrist. We got this in the bag. Well, I have scouts coming to watch me play today, so I'm feeling pretty anxious, she said with a nervous laugh. Of course, Anna should be used to this by now though. At almost every game, 
There were always scouts there watching her every stride and shot on net, trying to think of an offer for when she could eventually attend college. I started getting dressed and went into the bathroom to put my cup on. Even though it was Anna in there, it still would have been weird to take off my pants in front of her. With that thought in mind, I felt myself getting a little overjoyed below and groaned with embarrassment. I walked with my shirt pulled all the way down over my crotch and sat back down next to her. I was too focused on my boner that I hadn't realised Anna had taken her shirt off and was in a sports bra. Something came over me and I grabbed at her chest. What the fuck, Trevor, she streaked backing away from me it finally dawned on me that I had grabbed her chest without her consent as that sunk in I realised that I didn't really care as far as I knew I was the only one on the team to have touched her boobs and to see her like that I started to imagine all the guys patting my back once I told them when the locker room door opened disrupting my thoughts our captain Peter had arrived with a couple of our teammates in tow. They must have felt the tension in the locker room because Peter came over to me and handed me the speaker. Trevor, it's your turn to play the pre-game music, he said. I took the speaker from his hand and connected my phone. I started off with Nav and we all got ready. Eventually the whole team was here and the locker room was buzzing with excitement. Coach Jay was going over plays on the small whiteboard on the back of the door. I took a look at Anna, who had moved to the front of the locker room. Our eyes met and she smiled with her mouth guarding. That's weird. Only ten minutes ago, she was fuming and refusing to talk or make any eye contact with me. Maybe she realised she liked it. The buzzer went off in the rink, signalling the teams to get out on the ice for warm-ups. I grabbed the bucket of pucks and headed back out onto the rink. The ice was smooth without any bumps as I skated over to the bench to put down my water bottle. I dumped the bucket of pucks out onto the ice and we got into two separate lines behind the goal line. One person from the first line would skate up to the blue line. The second person from the other line would skate up a bit past the goal line and pass a puck to the person from the other line. And from there, they would have a breakaway chance on our goaltenders. We did this for about five minutes and then the buzzer went off again, signalling the start of the game. The pucks were gathered back into the bucket and put behind the bench. All right, we're gonna start with Anna taking the face off, Peter and Trevor on the wing, and Thomas and Brett on the D, coach announced to us. I made my way to the circle, skating right behind Anna. She looked at me and smiled again, which I couldn't understand why. Perhaps she was interested in me. My thoughts were yet again interrupted with the referee blowing his whistle, signalling puck drop. Woo! Peter yelled, running into the locker room. We had obliterated the Sea Wolves, 8-2. Anna, of course, had scored three out of the eight goals. She came into the locker room moments later after being pulled aside by a recruiter after the game ended. I was in no rush to go home. I had to walk since my dad was at work and I couldn't drive yet. I had lost track of time and realised that yet again it was just Anna and I alone in the locker room. You want to hang out? Anna asked, breaking the silence. When? Where? Right now? I asked. I was thinking we could go take a walk in the woods behind the rink and smoke. She smiled, holding up a jar of bud. I couldn't decline this offer. I texted my dad and told him Thomas and I were hanging out at the mall. 
Anna and I left our bags in the lobby, tucked in a corner and went to make our way to the woods. The Twin Oaks ice rink was surrounded by huge woods that had multiple trails for hikers and bike riders. Surprisingly, we only saw one bicyclist. The entire walk to the hidden pond. It was deep into the woods with fallen trees to sit on. It was the perfect place to go to relax, being completely surrounded by nothing but nature. You know, what you did before the game in the locker room really surprised me, she said in a hushed tone while rolling up the joint. Oh, did it? I smirked. I could tell she was flirting with me. Yeah, it really did she said before licking the edges of the rolling paper. Her weed had a peculiar scent to it, nothing like the bud I ever had. Maybe it was because her family was rich and she could afford good weed. Here, first hit goes to you. She passed a joint and lighter to me. I lit the end of the joint and took a huge hit, which was followed by vigorous coughing. Holy shit. This is strong weed, I said, already feeling the high coming. I know, she said with a smile. I took a few more hits and eventually passed it to her so she could enjoy the good weed as well. I looked around, taking in the birds squawking high up in the trees and the water in the pond rippling from the slight breeze. Can I hit that again? I hesitated and motioned to the joint that sat in her hand. Of course you can. She quickly handed it to me. I took a hit and thought to myself, wow, I'm really hanging out with Anna right now, alone in the woods. I'm going to kiss her later. I'm going to do it. Nothing will stop me. After taking a second hit, the muscles in my face seemed to have tightened. My mouth filled with a nasty metallic taste. Was that blood I was tasting? Just then, my calf muscles had begun to tighten up and jerk. What the hell was happening to me? Anna seemed to have noticed what was happening, but didn't seem to care much. I, I, I don't feel very well, I cried out softly, enjoying the weed. She asked with a smile, completely ignoring what I had said. I tried to speak, but the muscles in my body began to spasm, rendering me speechless, and my body filled with the worst pain imaginable. I looked at her with horror in my eyes. I had fallen off the tree stump where we were sitting on, and the contractions got more vicious Eventually my backbone began to continually arch. What, 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 what did, what did you do, do to me? I trembled weakly. What's wrong Trevor? You don't like strionine in your weed. Anna looked at me in the eye, cracking a maniacal smile. It was only then that I noticed the true evil in those blue eyes. You see, Trevor, my body is not an object. It isn't a toy or something you can play with whenever you want, she exclaimed. I'm sure you remember Steve and Paulie, who went missing a month ago and were never found. I tried to think, but the pain was too overwhelming for me to form any thoughts in my head. They were just like you. They couldn't keep their grimy hands to themselves, even after I told them to screw off hundreds of times. So I had to take care of them, the same way I'm taking care of you, she seethed. With that, the pain and the spasms got worse until I was struggling to breathe. Specks of light danced in my vision as I started to drift out of consciousness. The last thing I saw before closing my eyes one final time was Anna standing over me, plunging a knife into 
my chest. My girlfriend dies every day, posted by MTP6921. I'm trapped in the worst day of my life and I can't get out of it. Every day I know my girlfriend is going to die no matter what I do. The end result is that she dies. Each morning I wake up to do a quick assessment of myself, then of my long-term girlfriend, Kathy and we both appear fine. However, the day before, she always ends up killed in some unforeseeable manner. I have tried every approach from telling her in the morning that something horrible will happen to her that day, to telling her nothing, and either which way she dies by the end of the day. Her dying has happened so many times that we might literally be a 100 years old but we literally haven't aged a day past 29. The worst part is that she might have a small flicker of remembrance from the previous days. However, on the other hand, I remember vividly each and every of those hundred years of daily horror show rituals of Kathy being killed. There was even one day where we forced a bank manager to lock us both inside a bank safe and due to the lack of oxygen Kathy died and I only passed out. I sometimes wonder if I'm the one who is being punished for being subjected to her daily deaths. In a way I don't want tomorrow to come because then she'll really be gone so every day I live like it's her last. There's no alarm clock in our room so the only thing that usually wakes us up is the sun or the sound of a car whizzing by our house. After I assess the both of us to make sure that we are alive, then I get the immediate thought of how Kathy is going to die today. It's a shame I have to think like this, but when something has happened like clockwork for so long, I can't be naive to the fact this morning I wonder if I should change my game plan to escape her death. For whatever reason, March 18th had been the date and we can't move forward from it. The 18th is an even day which isn't really synonymous with anything special so I don't understand why this date was chosen. Watching someone you love die a peaceful death is heartbreaking but watching her die violently is heartbreaking and traumatic. I've set every booby trap in the house possible to try and stop a would-be assailant, but they always manage to get to her, or the booby traps wound up killing her. So this morning I just looked at her and think how is this going to be any different from any other day? She is only half awake and she has no idea that this is her last day. Based on the years we were born, we are only 29 years old. But because of this never ending day, we are really 129 years old. The oddest part about this whole thing is that death doesn't want me. And I am not even sure if it wants Cathy. Maybe there is a glitch or something where death has changed its mind on Cathy, but it can't reverse its course. Regardless, I'm stuck in this horrible parallel universe where I remember her dying every day. I had already sent out SOS messages on every social media platform, and the only thing that would happen is that I would get arrested for conspiracy to attempt murder, and later that day I would learn that she died and the next day would start all over again. March 18th is also a Thursday morning and eventually I'll convince her to skip work. I think today will do nothing but just lie in bed all day. 
There has been instances where she has been killed at 8.30am, so I'm not guaranteed a full day with her. As she wakes up, she says, Good morning, hun. I respond, Good morning, honey. She says, Aren't you going to get ready for work? I respond, No, we should both just take a day off work today. She says, I can't, I have this important meeting at 10am that I have to attend. After doing this routine for a hundred years, I tell her, please reschedule the meeting and stay here. She reluctantly agrees and we do nothing more than just talk. Yesterday to her is March 17th, but yesterday to me was March 18th, where she got hit by a car. I block out those thoughts and just look into her eyes. She looks so innocent and pure and I question why whatever controls this universe would do such a horrible thing to her each and every day. I continue to look into her eyes and she blushes. She asks me what I'm looking at and I tell her the most beautiful creature on this earth. She giggles and tells me to stop. The poor thing has only known pain and tragedy for nearly her whole life. She was adopted from an orphanage in Shechnia to a good-willed American household, but her adopted father died when she was six and her adoptive mother turned to alcoholism. Kathy's childhood was cold from constant bullying from other kids and she felt so isolated because she was an only child. So as I look into her eyes, I think how could someone go through so much and still be so nice to me? We continue our small talk and I entertain any desire she wants, including marriage, when we met, when we were 24, and I made it perfectly clear that I never wanted kids, but I would get married. So we talked and talked about getting married and she joked that I needed to propose to her, and I responded, I would, but it needed to be a surprise. I entertained every wedding idea she could ever imagine. Nothing was too expensive for her. I had already proposed to her and took her to City Hall close to 50 years ago, so I know this will have no bearings on her living or dying or tomorrow coming or going but I just like to see her smile I like to see her face light up I like to think that maybe this day will be different I ask her what she wants to eat and she jokingly says waffles with real maple syrup from the French restaurant in Philadelphia I say sure and get on the phone she looks at me completely confused When I bargain with the hostess to deliver it to our house for $200, she tells me I'm crazy and I tell her that I love her though. I have the worst case of PTSD known to man from watching Kathy die for a hundred years straight, but I've learned to block it out each day. There was a year where I would just hide in my pillow and say there, there's no sense She's going to die anyways, but not anymore. Now I'll just try to look at it as a good or bad dream, depending on my mindset. So we continue to talk and I steer her away from the trivial worries. We even talk about the basketball game tonight, where I could recite every single player's moves. I really just want her to be happy just in case tomorrow becomes March 19th and she's dead. In a way, this would be her hospice without the morphine and today I'm not going to think of any type of elaborate ruse to try to prevent the inevitable of her being killed because whatever happens will happen. This day really does feel special. Maybe I finally learned something over the years and maybe today I will finally end and become the 19th. We will even start doing guess what song this is from the 90s and early 2000s. Laughter can be so contagious 
and I'm glad I never lost the ability to laugh. I hear a knock at the door and I tell her that breakfast must be here, which makes her smile. I go to the door and pay the young lad that agreed $200. She stays in bed and continues to eat while we joke around and have fun. She asks me, why do you love me so much? I respond, because you're so beautiful. She says, oh, that's so sweet and giggles. It's not because of my constant worrying or my 2010 Honda Civic I drive. I jokingly respond, your Civic is definitely a turn on, but it's just you that I like. As she turns to tell me something, in her face goes blank. Then she slumps over into the pillow and starts to have convulsions. I immediately called 911 and they rushed over. The paramedics asked me if she had any history of seizure disorder or drug use or anything similar. I told them no and they rushed her to the hospital. Later that day the cause of death was listed as cyanide poisoning and I questioned every person at the restaurant to try to figure out why but no one fessed up and like every other day eventually I automatically passed out no later than midnight to wake up again on March 18th. As senseless as yesterday was I had to forget about it because today was a brand new day. I did everything the same as yesterday regarding what I said to Cathy and missing work. We talked about our wedding and I even proposed to her. Every day was unique and this day was going to be unique because when she said yes to my proposal and she got on top of me and was just so overtaken with glee, we continued to fall around and neither of us reached for protection, which either of us would have done for the last hundred years. We both got caught up in the moment and we just threw caution to the wind. The rest of the morning we did nothing but lay down in bed together. I had no motivation to see her get hit by a car or shot or even stabbed. So we did nothing but just lay down in bed. Though I tried the whole fasting thing over a hundred times already. The waffle thing was just still fresh on my mind and I convinced her not to eat anything. So we did absolutely nothing all day but make stupid noises at each other and play mindless guessing games. I was amassed that we had made it past 8pm but I remembered an instance where it was 11.52pm and she fell off the bed and hit her head and died. So I knew at any moment death was going to show its ugly face once more. In one way or another and I just hope it's the quick kind where I don't watch her have a seizure for half an hour or suffocate for her last breath of air. Hopefully someone will come into the room with a gun and just shoot her in the head and hopefully she won't even see it coming. Like the waffle poisoning incident and the countless assassins, I never knew who pays those people to carry out those deeds. Or... Is it something that was just written by whoever created this universe and decided to change their mind without properly pressing the undo button? Regardless, we finished watching the basketball game and it's now 10.30pm. We are both wide awake and she brings up tomorrow, which I've learned to just say yes to whatever she says. We do nothing more than just talk about the little things that brought us together and how lost she would be without me of her mother dying of alcohol abuse two years into our initial relationship. We just talk and talk and talk and talk and I try to think of her as a kid who has terminal cancer who will die in three months but wants to be a ballerina when she grows up in the corner of my eye, I glance over at the TV and it says 11.59pm and my heart sinks down to my feet 
I've learned to be cautiously optimistic, like when you scratch off a ticket and you purposely get two matching, win a thousand dollar a month for the rest of your life, but you know the third will never come. So as Kathy continues to talk, I block her out and just count down in my head from one to 60. By the time I got to 37, I said, holy shit, Kathy, it's 12 a.m. It's March 19th. Then I ran around the house like a bloody fool while I checked on her every five seconds to make sure she was still alive. About eight weeks later, I figured out what got us out of March 18th when Kathy surprised me with a positive pregnancy test. I couldn't believe that to get her pregnant was to get us to March 19th. Fast forward three months and as fate would have it, nothing can ever end that well. It seemed like I was destined to get Kathy pregnant because I had a ticking time bomb within my body. I was just diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumour and I have elected to forego treatment and will subsequently die in a matter of weeks. My last testament to Cathy was our child and now she won't be alone. And that's it for tonight, my little hellhounds. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and click that like button and tickle the bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. If you have any scary stories you want narrated on the channel, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares and follow me on Twitter at Home of Scares. Now, good night, my little hellhounds.